You have your Bibles this afternoon, and you would be kind enough to join me in John the fourth chapter. We're going to read a fairly lengthy passage today. John the fourth chapter, beginning at verse six, and we're going to read down all the way to verse twenty-six. John chapter four. Verses 6 through verse 26. And the word of the Lord from the King James text reads as follows. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus therefore being wearied with his journey sat thus on the well. And it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then? Hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water, springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water, that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidst thou truly. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. I want to point out here real quick. Notice that the Lord acknowledged they were worshiping the same God. He said, neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. So they were both worshiping the God of the Jews. Verse 22. Ye worship, ye know not what? We know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. 
Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Hallelujah. Let's go to the Lord quickly in prayer, Master, Savior, Redeemer, soon coming King. Once again, Lord, we go into the Word of God with a desire to hear a word from heaven. We've opened this sacred text today, Lord, with no less a desire to receive from you than that bird in the nest that cries out, chirping, waiting for mom to push the food down into their belly with her beak. Even so now, Lord, we like chicklings look up toward heaven, our mouths, our hearts, our arms open, desiring that our Heavenly Father would feed us with that manna from above. Oh, Master, if I'm to be effective in delivering the word of the Lord right now, I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I need the touch of the Spirit of God. In the short time we've been here, Lord, we have experienced all kinds of negativity and vitriol, hatred, nastiness, accusation. And Lord, if anyone from this community should be watching or listening right now, there's a good probability they're under the influence of a spirit of anger and they hold anger in their heart and they're mad at everyone and everything. Every experience they've had, they hold on to that angst and negativity. They coddle anger. Master, right now in the name of Jesus, I come against that old lion spirit of anger and I command it to flee in the name of Jesus. Let every heart, let every ear that is hearing this word be receptive to that which the Spirit of God would seek to communicate to His church today by reason of His servant. Help me, Lord, to deliver your word faithfully, properly, rightly. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. I was talking earlier in the service today about the fact that the church world has lost its way. Christianity, folks, is at a place that in my 58 years of life, I never saw it before and I never dreamed in a million years. I never dreamed that the church today would be full of so much hatred, so much anger, so much maliciousness, so much judgment, so much criticalness, so much fault finding. All the things that the Word of God tells us are manifestations of the flesh we are seeing in the church. And all of the things that the Word of God teaches are the fruit or the manifestation of the Spirit of God we are not seeing in the church. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, self-control. We're not seeing these things in the Christian world. And it is so sad that the church has fallen so far away. But you know, it's interesting to me because in the modern church, just let someone who doesn't know the Lord, just let them begin to have a conversation with one who calls themselves a Christian. And in very short order, the conversation will turn to conduct, morality, how people act, how people behave, how people talk, sexual orientation, gender identification, social issues, political 
physical issues. All of these things will become part of the conversation if you have a talk with most Christians in the world today. But I want to talk to you about conversations Jesus never had. That's the title of my message today. Conversations Jesus never had. The Lord found himself at Jacob's well in the territory that was operated and run and occupied by the Samaritan people. The Samaritan people and the Jews were greatly at odds with one another. The Samaritans comprised uh, of a people who were half Jew and half Gentile. They were mixed breed. And therefore the Jewish people rejected them. Isn't it funny how we can reject people so easily? Isn't it funny how we can find fault with somebody and not want them to be part of our church because we don't like who they are? Even though they're in the thing in the universe they can do about it. Every person born a Samaritan, my Lord, listen to me now, had no choice in being born a Samaritan. One the one of them that was able to say to the Lord before he came to earth, Lord, whatever you do, don't let me be born a Samaritan. There's not a black man in America today who had the option of being born with dark skin. There's not a woman in the world today who had the option of being born a man instead of a woman. There are so many things in our world that we have no control over whatsoever. And yet there are religious people who can hold against us things over which we have no control. I know LGBT people understand what I'm talking about. I'm going to share a little personal story. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to get a little personal. I knew I was gay, my God Almighty, when I was probably eight, seven, eight years old. I didn't understand sexuality. Sexuality had no place in my thinking in the universe. So it didn't have squat to do with sexuality. But I did find myself kind of developing a crush on other boys in school and you know there were certain fellas that come around and honest to God I was like a, you know my heart would just go patter 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 there was something about him didn't have a thing in the universe to do with sex I didn't even know what sex was you can stand there Mr. Fundamentalist Mr. Evangelical, you can stand there and try to accuse LGBT people of choosing a lifestyle till you turn blue in the face. I know better, and God knows better. So shut up. The Jews could hate on the Samaritans because they were the byproduct of mixed marriages, mixed unions. They could cause those people to have to live segregated lives. Oh, they can't, they can't live where the Jews live. They can't worship where the Jews worship. So did those Samaritans decide they were going to turn to Buddhism or Hinduism? Did they decide they were going to turn to some other religion since their own people? Because remember, they're half Jew. Since their own people rejected them? No. No, the Samaritans had a very different attitude. They said, you know what? You can reject us all you want to. You can push us away all you want to. 
we'll just find another mountain and we'll worship God on that mountain. Hallelujah to God. I'm here to tell you today, LGBT believer, LGBT person, instead of rejecting God because of the hatefulness and the stupidity and the ignorance of so many in the church, why don't you just find your own mountain to worship God on? Hallelujah! There is a ministry in this place right now trying to tell you they may not want you in Jerusalem, but we can worship God here! Amen. If you think God doesn't understand you, if you think God doesn't know why you are who you are, then you haven't read the Bible. But see, the enemy convinces us that it's a whole lot easier to just reject God than it is to find a way to worship and serve God on our own terms. I'm going to tell you something. I get so much negativity. I get bashed, harangued, ridiculed, name-called, accused, every single day if I wanted to take the easy way out I could just quit trying to serve God I could quit trying to preach this message for the benefit of those who have been ostracized and rejected and put out of the church I could just quit and believe me my whole my life would be a whole, whole lot easier oh by the way did I mention that all of that crap comes from LGBT people. Forget about the death threats that I've had to live with over 30 years. Forget about people stalking me in years past. Forget about the negativity and the harassment and the constant garbage I have to deal with from people on the religious right. Forget about all that. No. You know what? And I'm not kidding you when I say this. The amount of negativity I get on the right doesn't even begin to match the amount of negativity I get from LGBT believer. For, excuse me, LGBT people. Doesn't even begin. I get way more from my own people. The Samaritans could have been angry. They could have grown bitter. They could have taken their angst out on God. But the Samaritans were smarter than most people I know. And they knew it wasn't God's fault. They read the book for themselves. And I've got news for you, honey. It's in the Old Testament where the Lord first said, love your neighbor as yourself. It's in the Old Testament where this principle was taught and this principle was preached. No, the Samaritans read the book for themselves and they realized and they said, you know what? Our Jewish brethren are not doing this thing right. So, instead of hating on God, instead of turning on God and becoming wicked and rebellious, and, and, and I'm going to say it, and you're not going to like it, but I'm going to say it, and one day splitting hell wide open, not because we had to, but because we chose to. Instead of doing that, the Samaritan said, why don't we just start our own movement and we'll try to do this thing the way it's meant to be done. 
How many times, Tommy, have you heard me say, that's the vision I had for our ministry? Over and over. We're trying to do it the way it's meant to be done. We're trying to do it right. Why? Because if we can build a church that acts right and lives right and behaves like the Word of God teaches Christians are supposed to behave, on fire for God, full of the Holy Ghost, passionate about our faith, living a life of love and a life of grace and a life of compassion and a life of charity if we can build a church like that we'll wind up getting the attention of the whole country why? because they ain't nothing like that here I'm not I'm not picking at Episcopalians I'm not picking at Presbyterians I'm not picking at these folks I lived in New York City for 10 years I'm going to tell you some of the churches in New York City rephrase rephrase most of the churches in New York City that had homeless ministries and outreaches you know soup kitchens and the, the like were Presbyterian or Episcopalian It broke my heart. I sat there and I looked at this and I thought to myself, how do the Pentecostal churches, how do the Spirit-filled churches justify themselves in allowing what we call the high churches, you know, allowing the nominal or the high churches to do all these great things that ministered to people who were desperate and people who were in need. How can we justify ourselves in doing nothing but going into the building twice a week to have church and have Bible study? I was ashamed for the movement that I grew up in. I was ashamed for it. I said, all these evangelical and fundamental churches, and honestly, most Baptist churches are the same way. Most Church of Christ churches are the same identical way. All they do, Tommy, is preach and teach, and that's all they use the church building for. That's all the church is about. Jesus said to his disciples, when you go, he said, preach the gospel. Heal the sick, cleanse the leper, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. He also told the story of the end times when the master will return and he will separate the sheep from the goats. And he'll say to the goats, when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. When I was sick, you didn't minister to me. When I was in prison, you didn't come and see me. Am I telling the truth? And ultimately, he says to them, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. How were they working iniquity? Well, I'll tell you how. Because they weren't doing the things they were supposed to be doing. Had nothing to do with doing bad things. No, the Lord didn't say you're doing bad things. He said you're not doing the things you should be doing. And therefore, you are a worker of iniquity. And to the sheep, he said, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was sick, you ministered to me. When I was in prison, you came to see me. And those said to him, Lord, when did we ever see you in these conditions? When did we ever do these things for you? We don't understand what you're talking about. And he said, Inasmuch as you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. He was saying, folks, Inasmuch as you do it unto the least of the human family. When he said, my brethren, he was not talking about the church. He was referring to his humanity. He was saying, 
as much as you've done it to any human being, the least of the human family, you've done it unto me. Oh, but evangelicals and fundamentalists overlook that. They, that's a portion of Scripture they don't really care about. They're more interested in preaching against people. They're more interested in being hateful. There is a reason why, listen to me, children. I'm going to tell you, this preacher says some good things if you listen. There's a reason why there is a story in the Bible called the story or the parable of the good Samaritan. That was not an accident. Jesus did not tell that story that way by accident. The Jews couldn't stand the Samaritans. They thought nothing good of Samaritans. They only found fault and criticized the Samaritans. All of a sudden, you've got the Lord telling a story of religious Jews walking past a man who's in desperate need. And it wasn't until who came by that someone actually stopped to help that man? Why, it was a Samaritan. What was Jesus saying, folks? I'm going to tell you what he was saying. He was saying, God, news for you, my Jewish brethren, they do it right when we don't. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. They do it better than we do. I got news for you, Pentecostal high hair holiness. Go to church and shout your hair down and have hair pins. I'm all for shouting. I'm all for the move of God. I love the blessings that God pours out upon his people. I'm not making fun of none of that. You can shout and run the aisles. I'm all for it. But I'm going to tell you something else. When you do not feel compelled to do anything charitable, when you do not feel compelled to try to minister to the sick, or minister to the homeless, or minister to the hungry, or minister to those in prisons, or minister to those in nursing homes, then there is something wrong with you. And if this preacher has anything to say about it, one day, by the help and grace of God, I don't know what town we're going to be in. But we're going to have a church that does it right. And one day, in the judgment, Jesus is going to say, let me tell you a little story about a man who is in desperate need. And how all these Pentecostal preachers walk past him. And all these Baptist preachers and saints walk past him. And all these Methodists. And all these Evangelicals. And all these Fundamentalists walk past him. So disgusted by his condition that many of them actually crossed the road to get further away from him. And do you know who helped him? <laughs> it was the good queer. And you remember what I said about the sheep and the goats? The goats don't do these things, but the sheep do. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. It's funny that in the Lord's conversation with this Samaritan woman, he not one time debated with her over her identity as a Samaritan. He didn't condemn her. He didn't criticize her. She asked him, how is it that you being a Jew are even taking the time to sit here and talk to me? She said, the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. He had a conversation with her, and yet nowhere in that conversation 
did the Lord condemn her for being a Samaritan? Nowhere in that conversation did the Lord put her down or make her feel like that as a woman she was less than. Got news for you. That's exactly what she expected him to do. Because women in ancient culture, if you were a man like that, you weren't even supposed to talk to a woman alone in that fashion. That was against norms. That was against the rules. And here, listen to me, children. Jesus initiated the conversation, not her. Nowhere in that conversation did the Lord condemn her or criticize her or find fault with her even when he baited her and told her, go get your husband. She said, I don't have a husband. She said, the Lord said, I know you don't. You've had five. And the one you're with now, you're not married to. People do not understand how powerful the Lord saying that really was because we're thinking in modern terms okay she been to the she been to the altar five times said I do then she went to court five times got a divorce now she's living with a guy without having gone and had a marriage ceremony no wrong entirely wrong completely wrong you couldn't be more wrong In biblical times, there was no such thing as recording a marriage. You didn't record it at town hall. You didn't record it at the synagogue. Nowhere was it written down on paper for anybody's benefit but your own. Your husband-to-be presented a dowry to your father. If your father was pleased with the dowry, he offered you to that man to be married. You had little choice in the matter usually, generally. Unless you happen to meet the man like Jacob met uh, at the well. His wife to be at the well. You know, Rachel. In that instance, you would possibly kind of have a love connection first you know what I'm saying and then the man would go to the father so on and so forth but the process was simple presented a dowry if the father was pleased with the dowry whether you were already in love with the man knew him or not he if he offered you to that man that's who you marry period end of the story how did you marry very easy you went into a house you went into a tent you went into a private place and you consummated your marriage that's how you married period there was no wedding ceremony nowhere in scripture nowhere in scripture nowhere in scripture is there any wedding ceremony prescribed if marriage were this great sacred institution that the church tries to make it out to be, why would God not have said, when a man and a woman come together, this is what I want you to say. This is what I want you to do. But he didn't. No. Marriage is, in biblical times, was a contract, an agreement between two people. You consummated it physically. The understanding was that God witnessed your consummation. If you were well to do, if you had a little money to spend, you might have what is referred to as a marriage supper or a marriage celebration. When Jesus went to the quote-unquote wedding at Cana of Galilee, he was not going for a wedding ceremony. He was going for a celebration or a supper. The wedding, so-called, had already taken place in private, okay? All these people were now doing is making it known to the community that she and I have become husband and wife. That's how things were done in biblical times. Some people say, okay, well, so how does that change the story of the woman at the well? Oh, it changes it dramatically. Because 
When the Lord said to this woman, you've been married five times, but the man you're with now, you're not married to. He was not acknowledging that he was aware of her so-called legal status. Listen to me. He was acknowledging that he understood her mental status. He knew something about what was going on in her mind. Yeah, there were five men that you literally committed to with your heart. But now you're living with a guy looks like you're married. But you're not really committed to him. That's what Jesus was saying. This is why she said, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Had nothing to do with, oh, somehow you know I've been to the altar five times, but now I'm living with a man outside of marriage. Folks, in 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 uh, Jewish society, she couldn't have lived with a man outside of marriage. That was not permissible. They just stoned her dead. No. If you were going to live with a man, it had to look like at least you were committed to him. You were married to him. Jesus was saying, no, five men you've committed yourself to. This man now, uh-uh, you're not committed to him. So the Lord knew something that nobody on earth could have possibly known. A lot of people might know she was married five times before this guy. A lot of people might be aware of that. But the only person in the universe who could know that she was not committed to a man that she appeared to be married to now, because that's the only way you could get away with living with a man, you had to, had to look like you were committed to him anyway. Oh, I want to tell you, there's a little glimpse into the deity of Christ. There's a little glimpse into his divine nature. He knew more than just her state of living. He knew what was going on in her head. How she felt about the man she was now living with. And yet, for this knowledge, he did not say one single word to her of condemnation he did not tell her how to correct her living situation am I telling the truth he did not tell her that he found her immoral and ungodly he did not preach her a message on divorce and remarriage talking about conversations Jesus never had in Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 39, And one of the Pharisees desired him, meaning Jesus, that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat, in the Pharisee's house brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman that is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And we know as we read on in chapter 7 that the Lord answered that man's thought. He knew the woman at the whale's thoughts. He knew this Pharisee's thoughts. And he answered them. He said, yeah, isn't it funny? When I came into this house, you offered me nothing to wash my feet. But this little lady came in with her tears. With her heartfelt tears. 
will not cease but to wash my feet and to anoint them and to kiss them. Oh my goodness. The conversations Jesus never had. He spoke to the Pharisee of his wrong thoughts and wrong actions, but he never said a word to the woman about her sins. Matthew 21, 28 through 32. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. And he came to the second and said likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Whether of them twain did the will of his father. They say unto him, the first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, listen, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when ye had seen it, when they saw the, the publicans and the sinners and the harlots believing John, he said, when ye had seen it, repent and not afterward, that ye might believe him. Got news for you, evangelical and fundamentalist Christian. The Lord has laid out in the Word of God how He wants believers to live and how He wants believers to act. If you don't want to do it and you want to do things your own way and you want to ignore the Word of God, you don't want to live a life of compassion. You don't want to live a life free of judgment and condemnation and guilt. You don't want to live a life of love. You don't want to live a life of charity news for you. There are some of us that God has spoken to who are willing to give it a try. Hallelujah. And the sinners and the publicans and the queers will be in heaven long before you ever get there. Because you cannot believe the message that you're making no effort to obey. Churches in Huntsville, Alabama, today I can say this as a prophet of God, I declare this. They're full of unrepentant unbelievers. How do I know? I know by the fruit. Because Jesus said, by their fruit ye shall know them. And not only did he tell us you'd know them by their fruit, he told us what the fruit was. Got news for you, hatefulness is not on the tree. Hatefulness is not one of the fruit of the Spirit. Angst is not one of the fruit of the Spirit. Anger is not one of the fruits of the Spirit. Homophobia is not one of the fruit of the Spirit. Xenophobia is not one of the fruit of the Spirit. Nastiness ain't on there. Rudeness ain't on there. Judgmental is not on there. Critical is not on there. Am I telling the truth? Accusatory is not on the it's not on God's list of the fruit of the Spirit. Mm -hmm. And if you're not manifesting the fruit, then honey. You're not in the spirit. And you can call it everything you want to call it. You can try to twist it every way you want to twist it. The bottom line is, I finally one day decided I left church because some foolish people in the church hurt me. Bad. I'm not going to tell the story today, but <laughs> bad. But one day, like that first son, I said, you know what, I'm just going to get up and try to do what Dad asked me to do. I'm just going to get up and try to do it right. Do you understand what I'm telling you? Oh, there's 
People in the church hurt me. Why? Because they're not even interested in doing what the Father has asked them to do. Judge not, least you be judged. They're not even interested in doing what the Father has asked them to do. By this law, I've been told that you're my disciples. If you have love one to another, they're not even interested in doing what the Father has asked them to do. But you know what? I'm interested and I'm willing. Yeah, Lord, I may not have run out to the field right away. I may have had reasons. I may have had excuses. I may have had all kinds of thoughts as to why I wasn't going to do what you asked me to do. But in the end, I went. Hallelujah. And according to my Jesus, those are the folks going to get in. Oh, am I telling the truth? Before those who fancy themselves righteous and call themselves righteous. Hebrews 11.31 Trying to head toward a close today. By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. She was a hooker. She was a prostitute. But you know what? God spared her when the walls of Jericho came down because she had acted in faith and she had done right. Didn't mean she was perfect. No, she was still imperfect. She was still, she was still who she was. Doesn't tell us she repented and quit being a prostitute. Even in this passage in the New Testament, she's called Rahab the harlot. Oh my goodness. Talk about conversation Jesus never had. James chapter 2 verses 20 through 26. But wilt thou, wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works and by works was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works, actions, a man is justified and not by faith only. Listen, likewise also was not Rahab the harlot? Second apostle calling her Rahab the harlot. Justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. I told you, I get negative garbage come at me more often than you know. I don't even tell Tommy half the time because I just get tired of it. I, I, I just ignore it and move on. Got a message the other day on YouTube. Some dear sanctified fundamentalist evangelical decided to write me. Oh, so you call your church gospel centric, but you condone sin. I just deleted the comment. I don't give it a minute's thought. The only thought I had was this. Yeah, um, buddy, I guarantee you, I guarantee you I could list a dozen things in your church that you people don't even blink at that are sin and that are called by Scripture abomination. Divorce, Divorce and remarriage, molestation, rape, incest. And yet, I'd be willing to bet your pastor doesn't preach one word against any of these things. 
don't give me your stupid garbage about how our church is gospel centric but but we condone sin we don't condone sin but we understand that God's answer to sin is not our judgment. God's answer to sin is not our putting people out of the church. God's answer to sin is not our criticism and our condemnation. God's answer to sin is grace. And I got news for you. Whatever my sins are, you've got them too. And whatever your sins are, I've got them too. And bottom line, if not for the grace of God, heaven would be empty the day after the rapture. So don't give me your foolishness. I don't have time for that foolishness. What you call sin is what you want to see as sin. You only condemn those things that you don't do. It's like my Aunt Dorothy used to say. She said she wasn't in the church very long and she started out in a Baptist church in her spiritual journey, wound up full of the Holy Ghost, shouting and dancing in the aisles in the church of God. But she started her journey in the Baptist church and she said there was an old Baptist uh, lady she used to be friends with and she was talking to her one day and Aunt Dorothy said, I figured out what sin is. And this old Baptist lady said, what? My aunt said to her, what I don't do. She said, because uh, what I see everybody do, they condemn everything and everyone who's doing something they don't do. But if they're doing it, all of a sudden it's not sin. So don't give me your foolishness. I don't have time for it. Listen, if you believe this thing, you're going to act on it. That's what James said. If you believe the message, you're going to try to live the message. I'm telling you right now, I believe the gospel. I believe the teachings of Jesus Christ. And guess what? I'm doing everything in the world I can to do my best. I don't always do a very good job. But I'm trying my best to live up to those teachings. I'm giving it every effort I've got. I know a whole bunch of Christians in the church world today that say they believe and you don't see them even trying. You don't even see them trying to be judgment free. You don't even see in them trying to be without criticism and condemnation. You don't even see them trying to love everybody, straight, gay or otherwise. You don't even see them trying to be generous or trying to be merciful, or trying to be compassionate, or trying to be charitable. Am I telling the truth today? Yeah. Well, that tells you right there how much they believe this message. Faith without action is dead being alone. If you believe the message, if a man runs in the building and says, folks, your building's on fire, you need to get out. I can tell you who in the building believes that man without any one of them telling me they believe him. You know how? They're going to get up and they're going to walk out of this building or they're going to run out of this building. You can tell by their actions that they believe what he said. That's how Christians are supposed to live. People are supposed to know you're a believer in the gospel, you're a follower of Christ, by your actions, not by what you say. And those in our community today who allow themselves to be put off by people who say one thing and do another, you're foolish. You're, you're foolish. You're being pushed out of the church by people who don't even meet the biblical standard for a Christian. You're being pushed out of the church by somebody who's going to wind up in hell right beside you because they don't even know how to live this thing the way the Lord taught that we ought to live it. They're calling themselves a Christian, but their works, their actions do not support their claim. And according to James, the brother of Jesus, if you make a claim but you don't support it by your actions, then your faith is worthless. Got news for you. You need faith to be saved. Romans 10, 9 
30 through 33. I got to finish real fast to stay within my hour. What shall we say then that the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness, listen, which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, have not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore, or Paul saying, how? How is this happening? He said, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. He said the reason that they never realized righteousness is because they weren't pursuing righteousness by faith. They thought it was a matter of keeping the law. Got news for you. Half of the evangelical world believes the same thing. They don't think righteousness has anything in the world to do with faith. Uh, they think you got to act right. you got to do everything perfect. you got to live everything just a certain way. I'm here to tell you righteousness is of faith. That's our message in this church. He said, wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense. Now listen. And whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Hallelujah. Whosoever believeth on him. You know what Jesus never talked about? He never talked about people's lifestyles. He never talked about their morality. He never talked about their weaknesses, their frailties, their failings. He never condemned not one time. He never criticized not one time. The message that Jesus preached to the woman at the well is the same message I'm preaching today. Believe on Him. If you believe on Him, He has promised that He will put a well inside of you that will produce water like an artesian well that will flow up from inside of you and pour out of you. And we're told elsewhere in the Word of God that this analogy literally is speaking of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So I'm here to tell you today, this old spirit-filled Pentecostal one God, Jesus name, fire baptized preacher is here to tell you today, I'm preaching a message of faith, not a message of works. Because righteousness is not attainable through works. It's attainable through faith. But faith, oh my God, have mercy. If it's real, produces works. But it's not a matter of you have to pursue perfection. You have to pursue sinlessness. You have to somehow meet this standard of. No. It's a matter of if you believe, you're going to do everything in your power to do what you can. But you know what God never asks anybody to do? He never asks anybody to do what they can't. The Lord did not speak to the woman at the well about somehow changing her nationality. What we need to do, lady, I need to lay hands on you so that you'll no longer be a Samaritan. Nowhere in the Bible does God say He will ever heal and restore to the eunuch that portion of their body that has been removed. Nowhere in Scripture does God say, I'll heal the eunuch, or I'll restore to the eunuch that which he has lost. Nowhere. But the eunuch was denied access to the temple, according to the Old Testament law. And yet God later says, I'm going to make a place for the eunuch. Hallelujah. He said, it's a place better than that of sons or of daughters. Hallelujah. I'll give them a name that's better than that of a son or a daughter. But nowhere does he say, I'm going to fix them or I'm going to heal them 
or I'm going to restore them. No, they're still going to be a eunuch. She's still going to be a Samaritan. But the conversation Jesus never had is, you need to change something that you can't change. No. His message is, believe. And out of that belief are going to be born actions of charity, of love, of mercy, of grace, of forgiveness. And those works, those actions, are going to be with your faith what proves your faith is real and I will receive you. Because nobody, 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 whosoever believeth on him Whosoever believeth on him, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. I'm talking about conversations Jesus never had. Hallelujah. Praise.